Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. How about the remake folks in that? Are you well? All right. Let's get uh, get started. My name is Brad Bernthal. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship Initiative here at the Silicon Flatiron Center. Uh, and on behalf of Silicon Flatirons and Atlas, and this is Jill Van Matry, who's the associate director here at Atlas, as well as Bridget Bass, who is the what is your exalted title with the Boulder Software Club, Richard? The president of the Boulder Software Club. And, and the background of this event actually relates to a lunch with uh, Jim Franklin, who's here from SendGrid, and Richard over the summer, in which we were talking about the Entrepreneurs on Plug format. And, uh, and Richard and Jim said, we've got someone who would be perfect for this. And uh, that's how we connect with Paul. And um, over the next hour, we'll see whether he is indeed perfect for this. Um, but, uh, I, I think it's been much promising so far. Um, what we are at Unplugged for the first time? about half. Um, this is storytelling with a point. Uh, it tends to be a lot of fun. The format is we'll do about 45 minutes of moderated discussion and then for the last 15 minutes, about 7.15 or 7.20 or so, we'll do 15 minutes of audience Q&A. Of who is here, it's sometimes helpful to know how many students or people from CU are here. Awesome. Um, with that in mind, Dave's going to say something about the New Venture Challenge here momentarily. How many people from the technology community then, not to the CU? Okay. And of those, how many of you are CEOs or consider yourselves to be running the company? Okay, uh, fantastic. With that in mind, any community announcements? And we'll start with Dave and the New Venture Challenge. Let's go. Hi, I'm Dave Mangum. I'm a fellow of Silicon Flatirons. I'm the younger, more handsome Brad Bruntall. <laughs> Those of you who are CU students or faculty, we're doing the New Venture Challenge this year. It's our fourth year doing it. It's a cross-campus business plan competition. If you have any business idea that you hope to put into practice, you can compete. If you don't have a business idea but you hope to join a team that has one, you can also compete. The point is uh, to get involved, to work with mentors from the community who help out student teams to develop their business plans. Our kickoff event is October 25th, Tuesday. Networking starts at 5.30. It's in uh, Wolf Law in the courtroom. Uh, the form will start at 6 p.m. Uh, Paul Berberian, who's the CEO of Morbotics, is going to give the kickoff presentation. And just to give you an idea of what the overall arc of the New Venture Challenge is, kickoff is the 25th. Pitch night is November 8th. Uh, that's when students who have ideas can basically stand up and pitch their ideas to find teammates. Uh, basically from November through March, that's when you can work on your business plan. There's going to be different events put on to help teams develop their plans. Uh, with finals in March or potentially early April. Last year's team won $7,000, so there is some money involved in this, but there's also perhaps even more important the value of education you can get from working with both the people who lead our crash courses, but also the mentors that we can connect you with and help you with more individually. So uh, see where you can get more information. Uh, or just talk to me after. Thanks. So just to uh, this is really one of the great stories at CU, and it's Atlas, Silicon Flatiron Center, Deming Center, eShip. Think of an acronym across campus involved in entrepreneurship, and they're probably partnering on this, and so it's a great example of people across campus getting together to do the right thing with the students. So um, we'll talk to Dave about other things related to the New Venture Challenge. Any other community announcements, things coming up? We want to get the word out on them. Everybody at once. All right, there's nothing going on in the community. That's good. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce Paul and we'll get started. So, uh, Paul Guerin is CEO of Rebit, which, as many of you know, is a software company that essentially backs up your digital life. Um, one reviewer described it as the iPhone of backup software, which you had to love it when you saw that. You can't pay for that. <laughs> uh, more than 20 years' experience. Um, by background, he has a master's in biochemistry. His first job was at I was then employee number 176 at Lotus, which we'll get into a little bit shortly. Following his time at Lotus, he was COO at GTSI, which sells technology solutions to the government. Um, following that, he started Incorporated, which is an email company. Ultimately, sold that to Banyan. Um, his next startup experience was with Open Data, which is a business intelligence company. Followed that with a really interesting play that we're going to talk about with it tonight, Torrent Systems, which he founded um, or was part of the founding team in the early 1990s. And in Paul's language, 
They essentially forklifted MIT's high performance labs into the company before they knew exactly how they were gonna run the company with that technology. So a really nice story behind that. Followed by digital archeology. span And then um, happily he was brought to Denver in what I believe was the first job he ever interviewed for at Jabber where he took over as CEO some of you might have been here when Andre Duran was our guest for Entrepreneurs Unplugged, who of course was the founder of uh, Jabber. And under uh, Paul's leadership, they ultimately exited uh, quite happily to Cisco. And then um, his next and current CEO position is with Revit. Um, this is, in many respects, I think the epitome of a serial entrepreneur. Exactly why we do this series. Please help me welcome Paul Garrett. That doesn't, that's not, does that sound like that? Yeah, yeah. I'm not certain that people my age should still be doing this for a living, but uh, it's addictive and once you get started, you, you don't have any choice, you know, you can't go back to things like IBM and Cisco or what. Um, so, since we're here at a university, I want to rewind before the startups. Um, you got your master's in biochemistry from Rockefeller University in New York and started a PhD. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Rockefeller, your time there, and what, if anything, you learned about leading a startup? Yeah, so I don't know how many people are familiar with Rockefeller University. Um, it is really one of the most prestigious research institutes in the world. At the time I was there, uh, we had eight Nobel Prize winners. And uh, it is a university, but there aren't classes. You, uh, the assumption is that you understand your material and you just basically study independently and um, uh, do research. Uh, so it was, it, it, I, I ended up, this sounds like really great. <laughs> it's a little bit like the phone conversation. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I went to Rockefeller because, you know, it was, you know, it was in the set, like, it was in the 70s and, you know, people sort of had, you know, these glor great glorious ideas how you're going to change things. And we have 66 cancer research labs at Rockefeller. And so when I was able to go over there and, um, and do base, some basic research and start a PhD program, I figured, you know, well, these are the smartest people in the world. You know, they're all from New York. If they, you know, this, they could do something material. You know, you could really, you know, cure cancer. And um, it was probably, it was probably like sort of the ultimate in entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, one of the things I learned from being there is that the people who do that kind of work, they're like a natural resource. If they, uh, if they had a choice between getting a, you know, an enhancement to their electron microscope or getting a raise, they wouldn't even think about it, right? It's like, let's get the microscope. And so they really are a tremendous natural resource. But the thing that was tremendously disillusionary about it is that it's highly political. I mean, at Rockefeller University, it was all about winning last rewards, winning Nobel Prizes, and we had 66 labs, nobody, nobody from one lab would even talk to somebody from another lab. And, you know, I was really, really convinced that just at Rockefeller, if we could have taken all the research and brought it into one of the auditorium, just put it all out on the table and said, everybody can read everything that's going on, um, we probably could have advanced the cure of cancer in 10 years in a matter of days. And that's just one university, right? One big university. So the, the thing that was the thing that was positive about it is that you really saw people with incredible passion for what they were doing. And uh, when it comes to doing startups, there's no such thing as technology startups that don't have people in there that are passionate about what they're doing and why they can succeed. I mean, it, it is absolutely true. If, if you do an early stage startup, a zero stage startup, if you knew all the problems you're going to have between when it starts and when it 
they exit, you never start, right? You would never go about doing it. But the people who, just like the people at Rockville, the people who do, do, do startups, they, they don't know what they don't know, and that, you know, enables them to get going and, and you know, and being successful. So that was the mo that was the one thing I learned. I was the most important thing I learned was positive. On the negative side, um, it was probably the first time I realized that I just can't stand bureaucracy, politics, you know, and that kind of general bullshit, right? So, uh, and the university was as, was as, the university was as, probably as political a place as you know as, as I've ever been, and more political than I would say. Uh, uh, even a lot, of, a lot of a lot of corporations. So that's the first time I I kind of figured you know that for me I have to enjoy what I'm doing and it's I got to feel that I'm contributing and you know that I can see the results of my work. So you move from there to uh, the startup IBM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Lotus One Two Three opportunity comes along. Talk about your calculus in moving from the stability and reputation of IBM to Lotus. Where was Lotus at that point? Talk about being part of the rocket ship there. Yeah, so so Lotus at that time was um, in its early stages. That was 1983. We had revenue, um, but it was in a single digit um, revenue. And, and so the uh, students may not know exactly what Lotus did. You uh, so, so Lotus was, Lotus was the, um, so just to make it simple, Lotus was the most successful company in the history of American industry as judged by zero to a hundred million dollars in revenue. So our first year we had a 5.3 million dollar business plan and then we did 54 million dollars. Um, our second year we had a 50 million dollar business plan we did 160 million dollars with uh, less than uh, 300 employees. So um, send group, you got some. <laughs> now, I think, that, I think that may have been eclipsed uh, since then, but it was, um, and it was really at the whole crux of um, this, you know, the PC becoming a business machine and um, the transition from, you know, mainframes to, you know, smaller ways to get computing done. So, that, I mean, you know, all the stars were lined up, um, but it was, uh, it was absolutely a once in a lifetime experience and uh, you know really a thing like a Google or a Facebook or a, you know actually at the time Microsoft was also starting they were smaller than us um, I had the opportunity we did a product with Apple called Jazz that was a fabulous disaster but uh, I got to spend two hours um, with Steve Jobs in my office before he announced it at the World Trade Center and uh, so we were just the hottest thing in the country, and uh, that's what that's what Lotus was. Okay, so let's unpack two things there. Given the timeliness of the Steve Jobs reference, um, any takeaways from that meeting or other experiences that's influenced the way that you act lead it, lead as an emperor? No, By the way, did you see not, that? No, no, quite frankly, Steve, <laughs> that was when Steve was just getting you know Apple was like a cool thing, but uh, and that was the first Apple. So Steve was in it amazingly smart and amazingly you know, arrogant person, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I mean, I think you might know that like a lot of people, and not that our industry has any shortage of arrogant people, um, but uh, you know, now Steve was, you could see that this was someone who, uh, you know, I mean, he, he thought Apple was the greatest thing, and he was, you know, he, he wasn't even daunted by Lotus, and at the time, you know, we were, well, we, we had gone public, you know, and, and you know he just, you know he just thought Apple was going to take over the world. But he was, you know, he was a very, very confident individual. <laughs> How about in terms of your calculus to leave the stability of IBM and join Lotus? Um, what was your calculus at that point, and what you tell, say, uh, a student or someone who's at a, a major corporation today thinking about taking this leap? Yeah. What kind of calculus? Did you use? So, so that was that was my second experience with you know at IBM. I felt mm -hmm. like um, half your job was you know, getting connected to the person who was going to get your next job and, and half your job was working, right? And uh, I'm not certain how well you did your job mattered as much as how well you were connected. Um, and it was really, that was very, very disenchanting from a, from just like a, a how work style kind of thing. But then you had another thing going on. I mean, IBM thought word processing was a mainframe application. 
And uh, so, you know, I was a second lead rep before I, I was on staff when I left, but before I was on staff, I was on uh, a second lead rep on IBM's sixth largest account, MetLife. We were, uh, you know, we were pumping 10 mainframes a year into the offices in New York. Those things went at 10 billion a blow. Plus, you had to add all the peripherals. We were, you know, we were doing, oh, uh, I think it was about, you know, four or five hundred million dollars in revenue through one account. And uh, um, when you have an account like that, you look around and you start seeing these PCs appear. You start seeing these Wang word processors. And at IBM at that time, very, very religious, right? It's like, if we want your opinion, we're going to ask you for it. And other than that, please do not express it. You know? um, and that would be considered having a, quote, bad attitude, right? But in any event, you know, you'd walk around the you'd see these Wang machines, you'd see these, you know, these Honeywell boxes, and you'd say, well, this stuff is, is, you know, is, is pretty good. And IBM is saying, no, 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 word processing, we're going to run that on uh, on a mainframe, you know, graphics, we're going to run those programs on a mainframe, you know, we're going to queue them up and, you know, maybe you'll get an answer out in two or three days. And so, and then I, I was on the high performance employees list, and so uh, if you are on that list, you get to go to Harvard for a couple of weeks, and they, you know, they, um, you know, they, I guess, uh, groom you or whatever they're doing, right? They're, they're making you more socially acceptable, more ambitiously acceptable. But anyway, uh, so when I was up there, we had the number two guy at IBM come and speak to us, and uh, one of the topics came up was a PCs, and he just went off on how these things were tinker toys that were never going to <coughs> succeed, that there's no profit model in them. IBM would never be in that business. They could never figure out how to make money in such a silly business. And I sat there and I said, "This guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about." Right? I mean, he clearly has not been out into the customers. And, you know, we were selling an enormous logo back then. I mean, the IBM logo, that was the business. And when you left IBM, they didn't say you're leaving IBM. They said you're leaving the business, meaning that's the only place that the computer industry existed at that time. And uh, so I went to staff, and I uh, was working with one of these PCs. And uh, we had this kooky guy from Massachusetts come down who told us about how he had this, this program. And 123 wasn't originally going to be 123. It was actually going to be a program called TRIO. And uh, so we used to spend a lot of time preparing reports for, um, for I, was in the, uh, I was in the largest region in all of the IBM Corporation. And so we used to work in a 909, Ma 909 Madison. So we used to do a lot of um, stuff for headquarters in our mind. And so we were constantly, we were just gophers. There were 230 of us. We were just sitting there blasting out, you know, charts and graphs and stuff. And um, so what, the way we used to do it is we would queue something up on a mainframe over at 909 Third Avenue. And if somebody didn't blow your queue up, maybe two or three days later, you'd get a result, right? So this guy comes down. He's got this little thing trio. Finally, there's something we can do with these PCs that were fundamentally decorative ornaments at 909 Third Avenue, but they did have IBM logos on them. And um, he said, here, run this program. You just, just put this data in and create charts and graphs. And so I was like, this is amazing, you know? And I had no idea. I wasn't even thinking about using it as a spreadsheet. And uh, so we became like the stars of the region because we had this little program that Mitch gave us. Of course, that was Mitch Kapoor, the founder of 123, uh, founder of Lotus. And um, so uh, I had the chance to work with this stuff firsthand. And I went home one night and I said to my, to my wife, I said, you know, Mark, um, number one, these little computers are going to be really cool. And number two, the software is a lot more important than the hardware. And so they were looking for um, people to start their sales organization. There was one other IBM had been recruited. He was up in Cambridge. And then um, they recruited me for the for the job and I just said, you know, I was kind of fed up with the bureaucracy and the politics and I really thought that this software thing was going to be cool. I had no idea it was going to be as cool as it was, but um, I went over to Lotus and uh, that's, I've been, ever since then I've been doing software and, and progressively earlier state stuff. So you had a, you moved to GTSI um, and then 
had your first startup. Can you talk a little bit about those transitions? Yes, yeah, so, so GTSI was an exercise in greed. Um, uh, I got recruited by the founders. Uh, the, the, the fundament, the, all the money behind GTSI was um, Ashton Tate money. And uh, I don't know if you remember Ashton Tate, but they were, they did the first, they, they did a database company. They, they could have been Oracle, but they screwed it up. Um, but they were ahead of Oracle, and so Jill Tate and some of the other, Hal Lashley, uh, were the money behind GTSI, and they were trying, they wanted to take the company public, and they needed to get some resumes to take it public, because it was, GTSI was founded by a, um, and this is not at all meant in a derogatory manner, most of them are still my good friends, but it was founded by a group of Scientologists who actually were running it like it was a Scientology company. And um, so they said, well, we can't take that public, so we're going to have to start bringing some people in here who we can you know, do an IPO with. And, and IPOs were a dime a dozen back then. They were happening all the time. And so uh, I went down and met with Jill and Hal, and um, you know, they said, well, how much do you have in... Uh, in Lotus stock, you know, and I said, well, you know, I have a, a few million dollars that has invested yet, but, you know, that'd be worth it. And Hal starts laughing at me. You know, Hal had just made a hundred million on the Ashton Tate IPO. And he's like, that's all you have? And I was like, no, oh, I must be an idiot. <laughs> and uh, so Hal says, well, listen, we're going to give you a really good deal, and you come over here and do this GTSI thing. We're going to take it public, and you're going to make some real money, not this, this small stuff. And so, uh, that was, you know, there's only a couple of things I, re I regret in my life. I don't regret much, but there's two things I regret. Number one, I should have gone to Cornell instead of Siena College. And number two, I should not have left Lotus and gone to GTSI. <laughs> but what I found there, and this is a really, really important lesson, is that if you don't love what you're doing, um, go do something else, right? And it doesn't matter how much people pay you, they can't pay you enough to enjoy a job you hate. And I was making a lot of money there, I had a lot of people working for me, and I made it about two and a half years. I said, I just can't do this. This was, you know, it was not fun, it was not, it was not creative, it was, you know, it was just all about the money. And um, now I did become a sort of a PhD in government procurement, which has has served me well through the years, and I got some very interesting insights into, uh, uh, shall we say, the, uh, how your tax dollars are spent. I'll spare that. <laughs> but um, uh, I did, I, you know, I always try to take something important away from whatever I did. And at GTSI, the two things I, I was like, you got to do what you love. Don't worry about W-2. And um, I did learn an awful lot about government procurement, which when we did Jabber, ended up being a, a huge thing for us because we uh, sold a lot of software to the federal government, and it was a big part of our success. So. Let's circle back to that in a moment. So take us from uh, you're in a position that, well, pain, but doesn't inspire the same kind of passion you'd like, torrent, and talk first about forklifting the, uh, yeah, so the, so the first thing I did when I left DC back to Boston was a, was was a, a bunch of my buddies had started a, a company called Beyond. I, does anybody ever does anybody ever remember a product called Beyond Mail? No, it's too bad. But there's one person actually. Yeah, this was it was totally killer. It was the best email product ever. It was like totally fabulous. And uh, so a bunch of the Lotus guys did that. What year are we now? We were in uh, the early nineties. Okay. And. Uh, so, um, they were looking for somebody to take over sales and marketing, and, uh, and I said, okay, it's time to get back, and it was early, it was a very small company, we only had, we only had a few people, and that, that was close to zero stage revenue. And so, I, I left DC, and I went back to 128, where all my network was, and uh, did, did, our, did my first startup. That was a really, really well-funded startup, and we had Benchmark in there, we had Matrix in there, I mean, we had serious world-class money. Um, and we were doing good, we were making all of our plans, and uh, our, our revenue plans, and then, uh, you know, one thing went sideways. Uh, Microsoft and Lotus both decided that they would get into the email business. And we didn't want to sell them our company, um, when they first looked at it, and so then they each went out and made their own little acquisitions and decided they were going to uh, 
uh, get its email business. And I'll, I'll never forget, I, this is one of my important lessons with Microsoft. Everybody who knows me knows I've got some good Microsoft stories. But anyway, um, so we were doing really well, but my board was totally freaking out because they're like, how can you compete with Lotus over here and Microsoft over there? So the, the Microsoft guys come in and they want to license what was really our core of IP. We had this rules technology that enabled you to take mail as it was coming in and filter it and file it wherever you want and on all different kinds. And so it was, it was innovative at the time and, and we had this beautiful, beautiful client that really didn't take usability. I would take usability and software over functionality any time. But anyway, the Microsoft guys come in and they just want to license the stuff that we have that they don't have, right? And so we're sitting there, we think they're crazy. They're like, well, why would we ever license you our core IP? You know, I mean, it's total insanity. They said, well, there's one thing. They didn't even make us sign NDAs. This is how much nerve they had. Um, they said, well, there's just one thing we forgot to tell you. Um, we think mail should be free. So within the next couple of weeks, you're going to be competing not just with Microsoft, but with free email that we think is all part of the operating system. And I'll never forget this, this, this clown says to me. He said, uh, he goes, you know, it's not that we want to put you guys out of business. We really respect what you've done. He goes, it's sort of like we, we want to sink this big ocean liner, and you're just a little dinghy that's going to get in our way. What we really want to do is we want to put Lotus out of business, and in the process of doing that, you guys are going to go under. So what do you want to do? You want to license this stuff to us, yes or no? So, <laughs> what was the answer? No, we said no. We said no. Um, and but we did within one hour pick up the phone and call Batman Systems, who we had a strategic partnership with. Anybody who knows me knows that you always got to have a trap door, right? And uh, they had been after us, and it was I remember it was at Thanksgiving, and we said, you know, we think maybe the timing would be right to do a deal, and. Uh, they were over there right away, and we had the company sold for, uh, you know, it was only for 20 million bucks, but at the time, 20 million wasn't that bad. We all made money, and uh, we didn't have a little dinghy turned over. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, and then after that, the, the thing I talked about, so then after that, when, when you, um, when you're part of that whole 128 mafia. So just to be clear, I, I know that most people know this. This is Boston, Route 128. Yeah. That's why the 128 so, is shorthand. Yeah, so, so you got 128, you got Silicon Valley, have always competed and have competed more effectively in the software arena than in, in anything else. In fact, at the time, you know, really 128 was much, much bigger in software than uh, than California was. But, uh, you know, the investors in California, very, very aggressive guys and they, um, a lot less conservative than the, the VC community in Boston. They they made more bets and they had more wins. And you know Silicon Valley really, you know, overtook um, I took over 128. But 128 is still great. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of companies. And uh, the source of most of those companies are um, really their MIT. You know, uh, as I've said many times, I mean, we could have all survived without the people from Harvard. But we could have uh, never survived without the people from MIT who actually thought this stuff up. And uh, so. The Harvard alums, by the way. Yeah. The Harvard, the Harvard guys know that. The Harvard guys know that. They, 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 them and the VCs are circling MIT looking for the next good idea, right? But, uh, but, but in any event, um, so, you know, it, while there doesn't necessarily appear to be somewhat of a path, you know, one, two, three, start analytics, and then I did a, you know, BI thing. Email was, was off. When we did email, that's totally an outlier. GTS, I was an outlier. But then did a BI thing. And so BI was a derivative of spreadsheets. And then um, BI, business, business intelligence, you know, the, the category, which, uh, um, and so, so they you know, business objects and whatnot, and then both of which did great. One got bought by IBM, the other got bought by, I think it's Oracle Quota. But um, then this moved upstream into uh, the term that we coined, which was high performance business intelligence. So the, uh, again, I worked with a similar set of investors, Northbridge, Van Rock, Oak. They, uh, 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 as Brad said, when I lived in, we literally just forklifted 
the high performance computing lab at MIT, moved them across the street into this really nice building in Cambridge, and we started a company. And it was like, you know, nobody knew what the hell we could do with this thing, but we did know this, that we could process data massively parallel, right? So you could throw this technology at a data set that might before have taken days or even a month to process the data, and we could do it in minutes or hours, right? So, and, and, and the kind of people that can think like that, you know, can just think about how computing occurs hundreds of way, ways parallel. If, if you ever sit down with them and have them, you know, try to explain this to you, I mean, literally, this, this will break your brains. I mean, it's super hard. And so we had, if there were 15 people in the world that were really good at this, we had, you know, 10 of them working at Torrance. So this was, you know, technology looking for a home, right? I mean, this was, this was the cat, this was the classic, we got something cool here and nobody knows what, what we should really do with it. And so that, that's why they hired people like me and well, what do we do with this stuff? It's really cool, right? And uh, IBM was really interested. Um, and uh, we, we ended up doing a major strategic partnership with them for uh, a ventilator. But anyway, so we looked at this stuff and we said, well, okay, what are all the different data sets that you can process, you know, 100 or 200 ways parallel? Well, the first thing to come up with is they have to be really big, right? Because it doesn't make any sense to process a small data set. So we started looking at how many companies we could come to, and we only found out that the worldwide market for this stuff was if we could think of an application, there was only about 400 companies in the world that even had data sets large enough that this technology had any value to it. So we said, well, you know, these things are gonna cost millions of bucks of low and data's growing, so you know, we'll keep going. And we did, but then we started learning another important lesson is that you'll go into someone and you'll say, well, listen, you know, we're gonna take that data set and we're gonna, that used to take two hours to crunch that, we're gonna do that in four seconds. They'd be like, that's nice, who cares, right? So, lesson number two, there's a world of difference between nice-to-haves and necessaries. So we only had 400 companies to start with, and we said, well, now we've got to, to whittle that down. We actually have to find the companies who even care about processing data hundreds of ways parallel. And we, we ended up in a few industries. We, um, telecom, uh, uh, if you process all of the call logs of every mobile customer at AT&T, which we did, you can find patterns in that data that can predict when a customer is getting ready to leave, right? Churn is one of the biggest problems telecoms have. Okay, so now they'll pay millions of bucks for that. We, uh, we, we won application of the year um, with United Airlines. One of the most complicated business problems is pricing seats on an aircraft. Now, there's only two rules. It's really easy to explain, okay? Get the most, charge the maximum dollars you can for any seat, but never fly the plane empty. That's it. That's the problem, right? So you're like, how hard can that be? Well, there are every seat on every aircraft at that time had about 100 different ways you could price it. And so, and by the way, if you're lowering the price on an airline ticket, it doesn't do any good to do it a month after the flight took off, right? You want to be changing the prices on these things in real time. Anyway, this was massive amounts of data. We found a problem there. We did a similar thing in retail, um, marrying demographic data to sales data for Walmart. I don't know if people know this or not, but every Walmart store is different. How many people know that? Yeah, everyone is different. What they do is they marry sales patterns to demographic data to figure out what people want to buy, and then they put that stuff as far away from the front door as they can. So that you have to walk past all the stuff you don't want to buy to get there. And it results in a dramatic increase in their sales. And so every store is different because every store has different demographics, right? At, or different parts of the country. And um, so we had retail, we had the airlines, we had telecom, and then the obvious one, and at that time, the people with the big money who would, who would invest in anything, Wall Street, right? Credit card data, processing credit card data to figure stuff out, enormous, enormous data sets, and 
and um, there's a lot of information to be found. So we found four apps there. So, Julian, yeah. down on that, in terms of the process, how long did it take you before you found the first real pain? And talk about making that decision about this is a market that we're going to hit. How many, I mean, in retrospect, of course, oh, of course, airlines are going to pay for this. By the time you're dealing with imperfect information, how'd you go about collecting the data to find this is something that we really need to go to market with? Well, remember I said we started with, um, we had market research data that told us there were only 400 companies in the world even had data sets big enough to process. So um, uh, we didn't have like this enormous market to study. And um, the one thing that is good when you're a sort of a high profile startup on 28, you can get a lot of entrees. And so we started doing some real basic stuff, you know, talking to retailers and you know so we, we knew where who had big data and then we would go in and explain the kinds of things that we could do the kind of analytical functions that can be performed and then you know you just got to hit the street and, and but it was manageable right I mean if you um, you know how many big banks are there how many big retailers are there right and so so you, you know you waste a lot of time going places where it doesn't matter but once you get into the banks if you had an application that worked for one it worked for them all right and so I think that we, you know, while a lot of our research was, was grassroots, and I was always thinking in terms of analytics, because that's, you know, when you're a hammer, you think all world's a nail. And I thought, you know, we got to figure out how to use this thing for analytics. And, um, and uh, so high performance, we, you know, you can't say parallel computing. I mean, people are like, what else parallel computing? So we, we, we changed parallel computing we, we, to high performance, and then we figured, well, we're just going to call it BI. Everybody knows what BI is. It was at the time one of the hottest emerging spaces in the country, and so we said high performance business intelligence. So when people would say, well, what does Torrent do? Instead of saying, well, we process data massively parallel 100 different ways, we said, we do high performance business intelligence. People got it, right? And so, but we were able to, was, um, was, was uh, making some of those applications really work well, because because when you um, when you have MIT programmers, they uh, this is another really important lesson. Um, MIT programmers' definition of usability <laughs> is a blank screen with a C prompt. Okay, and so when uh, when you explain to them, well, it's just not reasonable to go into Citibank and tell them that they got to start typing Unix scripts into, this, into a blank screen to make this thing do its magic, they would say, why? You know? And so, so I, I, I'll never forget, it's a great story, we, we were competing for this business at AT&T, and uh, we were trying to explain to them the benefits of Unix scripting. And, um, <clears throat> The head of the, the, the she said, Paul, well, you don't have to explain that to me because we invented Unix here, in case you don't know that. Um, and she said, I'd like you to know we have more Unix programmers here in, uh, in New Jersey than uh, any place else in the world working for AT&T. But uh, she goes, I want to tell you something. That's not how I want to build my apps. <laughs> and I learned from that it's not just having something cool make it useful. Right? So our biggest problems were actually user interface issues and being able to implement these applications without customers having to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh, on consulting fees. Right? So, but it was, you know, it was a, uh, Torrent was a great thing. Torrent went on. We sold that baby to Essential Software. Then IBM snapped it up and they paid a lot more than Essential paid. Although Essential paid in the 50s, so it wasn't like a bad deal. Um, and then, then uh, IBM, and, and today that software from Torrent Systems is fundamental to a lot of the high performance computing stuff. We used to run on, as I say, on massively parallel computers. You know, Watson, you know, Watson's a massively parallel computer. Um, and uh, um, in fact, one of my good friends just got the job to be in charge of marketing. Figure, talk about having a cool job. He got a job at IBM to figure out how to be in charge of all of the commercialization for uh, Watson, you know, so. Let's have it here. Yeah. Bring, bring oh, yeah. 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 Well, no, I'd be happy to connect you. Dan's, Dan's a really good guy. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, at Torrent, I mean, you know, one of the things that's, you know, one of the things I was talking to Brad about the other day, and it, it kind of, 
you know, I feel a little bit, um, you know, when you come out of Silicon Valley or you come out of 128 and you look at Colorado, you're kind of like, you know, you really need two things to have a robust community of startups, you know. One is ideas, right, because if there's no ideas, um, it doesn't matter. So you need to foster that stuff. I think Techstars is great, you know, let's see how it, how it goes. Um, and, uh, you know, all Stanford and MIT are is, you know, supervised tech stars. And then uh, the second thing is you need money, right? You need a, you need a venture capital community that um, is willing to, you know, bet on the smart people to do these things. And I, you know, I, if, if we're going to have the ideas, you know, a place like UC Boulder has to be part of that, right? If not the center of it. And then the venture side, uh, that's, a, that's a different question, but um, it's, uh, we could certainly use a lot more venture money in Colorado, right, Tim? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but that's, that's really the, the formula, you know, you know, great ideas from great universities, and then VCs throwing stupid amounts of money at them. So, uh, unsurprisingly, we're running low on time for a number of stories I think people would like to hear, but mm -hmm. I know people would be interested in the Jabber story and a little bit about coming into that was like, <laughs> yeah, so, so by the way, Rick Emery's sitting right there, so Rick was, my, was the business development person at, uh, at Jabber, he's the best business development person in Colorado, if anybody wants to know, um, and he and I did a lot of the work. So, so when I came out to see, to see Jabber, it was a really, really a dysfunctional situation, and it started with the investors, the investors were extraordinarily so, so the way I the way I got connected with Jabber was <coughs> short and sweet. I was um, on the board of directors of a company out here, here in Boulder called RSI. You know, which, uh, we ended up selling a success to Kodak, and um, so I had a small mini network of people. And um, Jabber had been in, uh, the lead investor in Jabber was a really a, a small VC fund out of Wyoming called Jonah that has some other very very interesting investments in Colorado, but it's a, pri it's a private VC fund. The, 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 Nick, Nick McMurray, who is the behind it, is a multi-billion you know, there, and he's an oil and gas guy. And uh, so he had just put, uh, oh, I don't know, seven or eight million dollars into this thing, and it was really a disaster. So I get a call from the uh, folks at Casper when I'm driving around uh, Winchester, Massachusetts, uh, one day, and they said, you know, you don't really know who, who we are, but, you know, we know you through blah, 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 and we have this little company out here that we're looking for a CEO for, and uh, we're from Casper, Wyoming. And I was like, hmm. So I, I, didn't, I didn't know where Wyoming was, quite frankly. <laughs> and uh, would you be interested in flying out to Casper to meet with us? And it, if you talk about, like, you know, everything happens for a reason. I had just about a month or two before that said to my wife, I said, you know, I'm really sick of living here in Massachusetts. I said, I hate the politics, I hate the weather, and I hate the Red Sox. So um, I said, well, one more reason to do it. If I ever get a call, I'm going west. But I won't go to California. I had time to go to California. I didn't want to do that. So I said, if I get a call, she goes, yeah, right, right, right. You know, we're, we're here. So I come home, and I said, listen, I got this great call. These guys want me to go to Wyoming. And uh, she goes, you're not going to do that, are you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think I'm going to go out and meet them. So I go up to Casper, and I, I get out my map, and figure out why Owen sits on top of Colorado, and then a little, uh, little, little do I know that these guys have two hawkers, which are like $50 million airplanes. <laughs> they, uh, they were very, very successful guys. But anyway, so I come out, I go up to Casper, I meet with them, and Rick remembers this, and they were just the nicest and most honest guys, and they had been totally hoodwinked to get on their investment. And I, and so I said, you know, I'm going to go down and I'll look at the company. And I went in and I met the, a lot of the technical team, and uh, I met Rick. And the technical team at Jabber was like off the charts. This is another takeaway: you can't be successful without genius technology people. So if your technical team isn't good, either fold up the tent or go get genius technical people, which aren't that easy to find. But Jabber had some of the really smartest people I ever met. And they, and I was like, you know, I thought that what they were doing was really cool, but the 
the management team was in total disarray, the investors were in disarray, and you know, I went back and forth and back and forth. They came out about four times, and finally, uh, Mickey, I won't go into the details, but Mickey did make me an offer that I couldn't refuse. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And I, uh, and I, I came out, and I, I loved Colorado. That was the one thing that was like working for me big time. I was, every time I came out of here, I'm like, holy smokes, this place is it was like totally amazing. And I had, had my older experiences from RSI. And so uh, we went in there to do that. And, um, but, but Jabber, shortly after I was there, I realized that Jabber was an instant messaging company. And there was only one problem with that that instant messaging in about another 18 months wasn't going to be a business. And so I was like, if we can't figure out something really, really creative to do here, this thing is going up in smokes. And so we were going to change the whole positioning. And what we collectively agreed is that wasn't really instant messaging what was important about Jabber. What was important about it was presence, right? And the second thing that was important about it was it was a next generation uh, messaging uh, protocol, right? It, it's better than SIP. It's better than polling. It was a next generation way of sending messages. And so we decided we would, we, we knew we didn't have the money to get into unified communications, but what we decided we were going to do is we we're going to build this platform where we could bake presence and messaging, Rick's heard this many times, into all different kinds of applications, right? And our clients were completely um, uh, unimportant to us, right? It was all about this server that could scale to millions of concurrent users in a single instance. And when you start talking about scalability, let me tell you, scalability and instant do not belong in the same sentence, right? And so, but we, but these guys figured out how to do it, and we could scale. We probably could have done three or four million um, concurrent users in a single server. We just never found an application big enough to test it. Even to test a million to two million, we had to go to the Sun Labs to do it. And so, uh, we started uncovering lots of interesting applications. And uh, uh, I was telling Brad the one that we missed that you know, you always got a few of these stories, but the one that we missed is the Twitter guys came to us. The Twitter guys could be our messaging infrastructure. Right, Rick? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so I look at this stuff, I look at this stuff and I said, I said, you know what, I don't get it. I mean, who the hell, who the hell? <laughs> But I was smart enough, okay, like the nuns used to say, I was smart enough to know what I didn't know. So I said, you know what, guys, I don't get this, but it's not targeted at me. I think we ought to just play with it, you know? And I, we turned it over to our CTO. We said, you know, make a deal happen, do something, right? Well, these Twitter guys were at the very, very beginning. They had no money. They had Zippo. They didn't even have like $1,000. So our CTO was trying to squeeze 25 grand out of them. I said, this is like squeezing new millions out of them. It's not going to happen. Anyway, so I was in favor of trying to, to just work with them. But our technical people, and, and in, in case you don't know this, technical people, you, you can persuade technical people to do stuff. But at the end of the day, they're going to say, you know, we're smarter than you, and we're going to do what we want to do, right? And so they, I could, I, they, we didn't do it. And we could have been, you know, we could have been the whole infrastructure for, for, for Twitter. But we found lots of other really interesting apps. and. Uh, that this was not only scalable, it was really secure. And every spook agency in uh, the United States government uses Jabber as a form of uh, communications. If you're, a, a, if you're um, a special ops in uh, Afghanistan and you go into some internet cafe and you want to send a message, that's going over um, uh, Jabber stuff because we could build zero footprint clients. We could build clients that you could never trace back to the uh, you know, back to the computer. And so we, so who else cares about these kinds of things? You know, Wall Street, we saw a lot of stuff too. Um, all of the government agencies really cared. And then we started doing really interesting things like um, uh, electronic arts, gamers, right? So gamers want to go on the internet and they want to figure out 
who else is out there that might play a game with them, right? So you need some really cool messaging infrastructure to discover who's out there and, and connect. And that was a big app. So I said, well, you know, how many of these, these uh, gamers you got? They said, oh, we got like 40 million of them. So I was like, you know, we're the only game in town. Nobody can talk about anything that big. And so we did electronic artist deal. And then um, Cisco, of course, when we were an instant messaging company, Cisco had zero interest in buying Jabber, none. But when we changed the position of it to being this application platform where you could bake presence and messaging into a whole broad range of solutions, we had something not only super valuable, but super unique. And uh, when Cisco looked at it the second time, we, uh, we ended up getting, uh, getting a really, really good deal done. And now, uh, originally it was, our stuff was put into the presence of messaging for all of WebEx, but now it is being baked into every communications um, our product, uh, uh, you know, IP-based communication product that uh, Cisco sells. And so, um, you know, I mean, I think at Jabber, we all thought the same thing. We thought we had something, even, you know, we could have, Nobody's complaining. I mean, one thing I've learned, when you make money, never complain. We all did well. Five of us did very well. Um, however. However, you know, you know I, look at, I look at some of the other social networking stuff, and I was like, but you know, the bottom line is, my investors didn't have a stomach. They hated each other, and uh, they really did. I mean, it was very, very dysfunctional. And so, you know, it's like, one of the things you learn is, that everybody has a lot of courage until somebody puts 50 or 60 million on the table and then you find out who has courage, right? <laughs> and uh, in most cases, it's hard to turn down, you know, a really good offer. And everybody made money and worked out, but, but Jabber could have been, um, we, we could have gone a lot further. You know, we could have gone a lot further with Jabber, but that's, you know, it was still a big success. So final question, then we'll open it up for, uh, <clears throat> for audience questions. Um, you mentioned before your belief in the value of strategic relationships for a startup, whether in the context of Revit or one of the earlier companies. Talk about the strategic relationship that you've established and then long term why you think that's a good strategy. Yeah, so so it's like the old Alice in Wonderland thing, right? I mean, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And so I think it's really, really important to be successful that you have a clear vision of what it is you're trying to do, why it's unique, and does that have any real value? Is it a necessary or is it just a nice to have? And you have to be brutally honest with yourself because a lot of times what you start with is cool, but it's not necessary. And, it, and, and most startups, I mean, if you ask any VC, he'll tell you, the thing I invested in and the thing I cashed out have no connection, right? And so you need a team that is willing to be agnostic, to not be religious about what you're doing, okay? So to answer Brad's question specifically, one of the ways that you prove that you're not just talking to yourself is you go out and you form major strategic partnerships with people who have the money to understand what's going on in the marketplace and can prove to you that uh, what you're doing has value, right? And so, you know, we had tremendous partnerships at Jabber. We had partnerships with Cisco, with Avaya, with um, uh, British Telecom, France Telecom. Um, uh, uh, I just talked about um, electronic arts. I could go on and on, rip them all. And um, these things do several things for you. First of all, they give you some revenue, right? I mean, you have to, you know, this, the Barney relationship, you know, the I love you, love, you love me, that's not worth anybody's time, right? So you don't do that. But, but a lot of times when you look at these strategic partnerships, folks think of them just in terms of revenue. It's just like a glorified sales job. I'm selling to Oracle as opposed to, no, that's not what you should do. You should look at them strategically because yes, it can be a source of revenue, but it can also help you understand. It can be verification that what you are doing is unique. Okay, at Revit right now, we're doing um, tremendous work with uh, Dell and with Seagate and with Carbonite, okay? Now, these guys have more money and more research dollars and more MBAs than we have at Revit. We don't have any MBAs, I don't think, but um, 
If they think what we're doing is really interesting and valuable, it's probably interesting and valuable because they can study the marketplace and understand, right? So it's revenue, it's market research, and then of course, you, you, your chance of taking a couple of company public today is very slim. So, you know, no one's going to pay more for a company than another company that knows you really well. And so I'm a believer in having a handful of these things, hopefully, that you can play off against each other, right? And, um, and if you get yourself in a position where you don't know what to do, you're not just sitting there with some banker saying, you know, who the hell wants to buy this thing, you know? Or why would they want to buy it? You know, you have people who really understand what your technology is. So I happen to believe in this day and age, business strategic business development is more important for all of those reasons than it's ever been before. And and that even, you know, a lot of the stuff I've done, you can tell, is, has been business-related types of software or applicable to business. But the same thing applies to social networking or to, you know, wh whatever. I mean, and so I think it's really, really important that you try to, to form real strategic partnerships on all four of those fronts. And then the, the, the last thing I would say is that when you go and do a strategic partnership, it's like I do this with every, every contract I do, every business relationship. Put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Is this something you would do if you were him? Right? And, you know, relationships, even if you can get a relationship done where the other guy gets screwed and you win, you're going to get screwed eventually anyway because how long do you think it's going to last? I mean, when, when someone enters into a deal that they are sorry they got into, it's uninteresting to them, right? So when you go to put these things in place, put in, in place partnerships that work for both sides, where the teams are actually happy, you know, to be working together, and, and they're both mutually benef you know, beneficiary, bene benefiting from it. And it may not be the most, you know, you might have been able to get a little bit more revenue, take a little bit less revenue, and have a really good partnership. So I think B, I think BD and, and I don't see the IPO thing changing. You know, you hear I mean look at even the problems Groupon's having. I mean it's unreal, right? And you know, Facebook they'll do good, but you know, there are very few these IPOs are you know, they're just not what they used to be. They're really, really hard to do. And so I, I think that when you're when you're starting your business, you know, you ought to have um, in the back of your mind, if I had to get out of this thing in twelve months. Could I, you know, could I get some kind of a decent return in it? And I think strategic partnerships are ready to do that. All right. Um, so we've come up on an hour. If anyone wants to make an elegant exit without any shame or disapprobation, delivery of a low cost investment into uh, these nice to have things that certainly will never be necessary. Um, you know, yeah, I, I do to, to some degree. But if you look at apps and, and how they sell, um, the ones that everybody has, and I'm not talking about gaming. Gaming is a different thing, but if you're talking about you know, apps that are that provide, provide some kind of utility, the ones that are really, really um, ubiquitous, they've got some value, right? So I, I, I guarantee you, if you ever saw, if you went onto the app store and you saw all those apps, you're going to see long tail on steroids, right? I mean, you're going to see a 98% of these things have sold, you know, a, a very, very, very few copies. So I think there is, there is, oh, that's a little bit different. I mean, your cost of sales has gone down. The apps it's so low that you can, you know, you can make money without having to necessarily even generate lots and lots of revenue. But I, I still think that it, intrinsically there has to be some very unique and compelling value in, in order for something to, to, to be really broad, you know, to be really broad based. And then again, you, you know that. I mean, look at the app store. There's lots of cool things, right? But how many do you, if you look at the average person, how many does the average person really use, right? Yeah. Is there a point where something that's cool becomes something that's necessary? I mean, like looking at Facebook and things like that, which 10 years ago you would have said, yeah, that would be cool. But then it kind of starts small and it builds and it develops and then it becomes something totally necessary and it spins off on a life of its own. It becomes so pivotal and central to what people do that if somebody said, take away Facebook, everyone would say, wait, what? What? No. No, you can't. So where does that happen and how do you spot that 
Yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not 100% certain that, that Facebook would be a good example, because, you know, Facebook took off like a bottle rocket almost from the beginning. You know, I mean, when they, at first it was, you know, just like the Harvard kids, and they all signed up and replaced their Facebook, and then they made it just .edu. But, I mean, every, it's kind of has gone, you know, every, every um, audience they've introduced it to, it's, it's, it's taken off, and then now adults are, you know, so, so I'm, I'm not a... 100% um, certain that Facebook would be a good example, but I would agree with you on this. Timing is everything. And it's why a lot of startups, um, you know, you can really, really be ahead of your time with technology. And, and so, but how do, you, how, how do you deal with that, right? I mean, the, the advice I would give is that if you if you start a company and you get funded, don't think that you can control time. Okay, believe me, little companies can't make markets. They can't do it. Okay, they can only fill a requirement that exists in a market. They might identify a requirement and switch. But if there's no need in the marketplace, no little tiny startup's going to make that happen. So I think the mistake that companies can make is that before they really, really understand the market for their product and how mature it is, um, they go and spend lots of money on marketing and sales and they crank up their, you know, their burn really high because, oh, once we get this thing done, there is going to be this unsatiable demand for this stuff. And then, I mean, I'm telling you, it happens all the time. That, uh, that that's not the case. So I, I would say that it's very, very difficult to understand the timing in the marketplace. You're never going to understand it if you don't talk. Get out of your offices and go talk to real live users of the stuff. But I would say that if you get funded and you have an idea, I don't care how cool you think it is, keep your burn really low until you can demonstrate that there's a real market for that. Because it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to predict, and you're 100% right on this. There have been many, many startups who had great ideas, but they were just, you know, they were, you know, they were ahead of their time, right? So. If you, um, so did you create a product and you're looking for a strategic partner, um, what are you looking to, like, present to like, develop that relationship? And what are, like, kind of, like, what are you looking for? And so for those in the back who didn't hear the question, the question is, if you're looking for a strategic partner, what types of things do you show them in order to get them interested? And what do you hope that they will uh, respond to? The first thing I would say is, um, assuming you're the little guy and the partner is the big guy, um, you have to be realistic. The big guy doesn't care. Right? And the big guy has every you and everybody else under the sun calling them with an next great idea. So what I would, what I would do is, I would spend time understanding what the big guy is doing and where you think your technology can enhance that experience. You can bring something of unique value. I think when you talk to business development people today, and it's become a real, real science, and even inside of you know, the really big companies, they do an awful lot of research to understand what's in the marketplace they know before you will ever know what gaps there are in their products that, that, that they want to fill. And so what I would suggest is that you understand as best as you can what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve. And then when you, get, when you connect with these biz, business development people, um, try to understand. I can guarantee you they know what they're looking for. Try to understand what it is they see as a requirement to enhance their product, the itch that, that you can scratch. right? And you know, if you're going to do a um, if you're going to do a strategic partnership, I think that revenue is important because you know one thing I've learned is that if nobody's if there's no money at stake, nobody cares. It's just that's just the way it is. Now that's only more so true now than it was ten years ago, but no one's got time to to just like experiment anymore. Most of these companies that used to have groups that did nothing. But bring in cutting edge technology to, 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 to test it. You know, I mean, every early stage company could just go to Citibank and Citibank, sure, you know, we've got a lab, bring it over to the lab, we have it. They don't have the money for that stuff anymore. 
So that stuff is gone. So you um, you want to do a, a deal that has uh, revenue associated with it, because if there isn't, they're not going to care. But I think just as important is you want to know, is there a way that I can ride that other person's marketing? Right? Is there a way I can ride that other person's sales efforts? You know? And so uh, I, I would say revenues first, marketing is, and, and marketing is second, not just you know, it's, is there a way to ride the brand? And, and companies are pretty protective of that. That's, that's a lot harder to do than it sounds. In fact, you'll, you'll find a lot of times you go all the way down the road and then you want to do a press release. No, no, we don't allow press releases. Our name has too much value, right? Or, you know, or whatever. So, so I, I think it's in many ways getting press out of a partnership is even more important than the revenue. Because the way you can use the internet now to disseminate information and news you get a really good hit with a, a one strategic partner and you put it out there, you're gonna get the phone calls. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's a lot easier to get the, you know, get, the, get the news out. But understand, try to understand what they need, not what you need. You know? And that's the mistake all over the time. Oh, I'm great, you, know, you need me. No, no, trust me, they don't. Okay? <laughs> they don't. So try to understand how you can help, you know, how you can help them out and take the time to understand what their business is so that you know when, when you're talking to them it's not like you know does this you know does, does this guy even know what what we do for a living and, and uh, that, that would be some advice that would give last question yeah so in your opinion what are some technologies or markets that uh, the younger generation should be focused on that will be big in five years or <laughs> Maybe ten years. Oh, That's a boy. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, I really don't. I mean, it's um. Well, probably the best thing I could do is from an information standpoint is that there have been unquestionably like major seismic things that have occurred. You know over the last 20 or 30 years in technology. You know, you had the PC stuff, and you, know, you had the internet. We all, all know what they are. And in my opinion, um, we've, so we don't have to talk about social networking. Everyone knows that social networking in every way, shape, or form is gonna be baked into lots of applications. But um, I think that we've never been closer to for, for 30 years, they've been talking about um, applications being delivered the same way electricity is delivered, right? It just, you know, but there hasn't been the pieces for it, right? You, you know, you need a lot of cheap bandwidth to do that, right? And you need a lot of, you know, what now is cloud infrastructure. Um, I would say that if I was looking in an area, to, and, and I believe that cloud computing is going to be huge. And I think that we're finally going to start seeing, you know, you do have, you know, like Salesforce.com is, is, is a good example, but you're going to start seeing lots of applications delivered as, um, you know, over the internet. I think two things that are going the way of the dodo bird, the first one, which already has gone the way of the dodo bird, we just haven't acknowledged it, is telephones. Like, who needs a telephone, right? And the second, the, the ones on your desk, you know? <laughs> and the second thing is, I, I think the PCs uh, are a thing of the past. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, you're gonna, you know, you could, uh, you, you, you know, some of the things that you can do like with an iPad now, if you want to, if you really want to trick that thing up, you don't even need a laptop so much anymore. So I, I think that the, an area is cloud computing, and I think applications of all different sizes and shapes are finally you're going to be able to buy them as a as a service. And I think that they're not going to be delivered. I think laptops, desktops, and telephones are. Um, I, I I I would say in five years we're all going to be shocked if you walk in here with some Dell boat anchor that weighs eight pounds, and you're going to look like it came from Mars. You know? I, mean, I, really, I really think that. I think that you're going to see that stuff go way down really, really fast. I, think, I don't think things like the iPad are a fad. Okay. Thank you.
but you've got all the pieces for you know we finally have lots of cheap bandwidth, right? I mean you know the, the things like Google App. When I, when they first did that, I was like, wait a minute, look at all the problems. You know, you, you got, how how are you connected? What happens when you're on an airplane? You know, now where there's almost nowhere you can go that you can't get a nice Wi-Fi connection, right? I mean, it's, the connectivity is almost becoming something you have to now think. I was thinking about it the other day because I have a data card that I use for emergency purposes. And I hardly ever use it. You know, I mean, there's very, very few times that I just can't find that I can't just get a Wi Fi connection somewhere, right? I mean, but from the time I got that from ATT two years ago to now, I hardly ever take it out. And there's almost no place that yet, you, you know, that you have, have an issue, but you need lots of cheap bandwidth. We have it. You need lots of really cool infrastructure computing in the cloud, and that stuff is, is coming out. And uh, so I, I think you're going to see applications become delivered in a whole whole different model. Well, uh, so Richard and Jim, many thank yous for recommending Paul. Paul, this has been true. Please help me to say thank you.